So here's a good point to review the anatomical distribution of some major lymph nodes. And here's a nice little image from the National Cancer Institute, which illustrates where in the body these nodes are found. Just one thing to mention, here we've written primary lymph node drainage site, but this has really no relation to the primary and secondary lymphoid organs that we've been talking about, nor does it refer to primary or secondary B-cell follicles. It's perhaps better just to write major, as in the major lymph nodes that are draining certain areas of the body. And again, they're major because they're clinically relevant. These tend to be some of the larger nodes, or node plexuses, which a clinician can palpate when a patient has an infection. For example, the axillary nodes, which on the drawing are shown here, drain the upper limb and lateral breast. This one is particularly important because when certain breast cancers metastasize, they can do so through the lymphatics. And because most of the breast tissue is located on the upper and outer quadrant, breast cancers arising here might drain to the axillary node. You might have seen an image like this before, representing the breast tissue. And here we might have the nipple. And as you can see, if we divide the breast into fours, most of the tissue is actually in the upper outer quadrant. And again, will drain to the axillary node. Other important nodes are those which drain the testes and the scrotum, or similarly the ovaries, or the labia. Notice that the gonads are actually drained by the paraaortic lymph nodes. These are found close to the aorta and very much near the location from which the gonads descended during embryonic development. Even though the gonads descend, the nodes which drain them actually stay very close to their original location near the aorta. Contrast this with the superficial inguinal nodes which drain the scrotum and the labia. Because the tissues which eventually form the scrotum and labia did not migrate during embryonic development, you'll tend to find their nodes very close by, namely in the superficial inguinal area, which you can see here. Remember when I talked about our patient who might have an infection in his foot? Well, here it is. If the infection is occurring in the lateral side of the dorsum of the foot, that area is actually being drained by the popliteal nodes, which you see here. Other areas of the leg, however, will likely drain to the inguinal node. Finally, you should note that while all these nodes collect cells and fluids from their respective tissues, they ultimately drain into a larger system, which then drains into the systemic circulation. The right lymphatic duct is the ultimate destination for the lymphatic vessels and nodes, which drain the right arm and head. Of course, this is the right side. Whereas the thoracic duct is the ultimate destination for the lymphatic nodes and vessels from the remainder of the body. Again, of course, the thoracic duct ultimately connects with the left brachiocephalic vein or left subclavian vein. This can actually differ between patients, but the main point is that it is draining into the great veins that will eventually become the superior vena cava, and the right lymphatic duct typically inserts into the right subclavian vein. All right, let's move on and briefly talk about the spleen. We won't go over the steps of activation again. We'll just touch on this briefly, and you'll see how the architecture of the spleen very much parallels the architecture, or microarchitecture as I called it, of the lymph node. Again, these are both secondary lymphoid organs, so that shouldn't be too surprising. Now, in terms of its gross anatomy, the spleen looks very different from a lymph node, but conceptually, the units which are involved in B and T cell activation are really organized almost identically. Let's go back to that drawing from a few slides back. After we talk about the spleen, just be sure to convince yourself that this basic unit of structure is as true for the spleen as it is for the lymph node. Okay, so let's flip back now. Notice that we have the same thing going on here. Here's our central vessel, and in the case of the spleen, it's called the central arteriole. And then just surrounding that, closest to the vessel, we have our collection of T cells. In the spleen, the T cell zone has a special name, which we abbreviate PALS which stands for periarterial lymphatic sheath. Periarterial because it's around or close to the central arteriole. Lymphatic because these are lymphocytes, namely T lymphocytes. And sheath because these T lymphocytes form a kind of sheath or covering around the central arteriole. Also notice that abutting our T cell zone, or PALS, we have our follicle, the B cell follicle. Together we call this area of the spleen 
that is that part which houses the B cells and the T cells, the white pulp. Because under histologic examination, it appears paler or more white than a nearby area known as the red pulp, which appears red. The red pulp is sort of an open area, that is, it's very much fenestrated and composed of big open channels, which is being fed by the spleen's arterial supply. Of course, this coming from the splenic artery. In the red pulp, in the closely associated marginal zone, you'll find a lot of antigen-presenting cells, like dendritic cells, but also macrophages. The spleen is actually very much enriched with macrophages, and this may be one of the more unique distinctions between it and the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes also have macrophages, but the spleen is a much greater source of them. The spleen serves as a site of activation for B and T cells, of course, but it's also a very good place where macrophages can sample what's floating around in the blood. This is, of course, because the blood is being circulated and filtered through the spleen via the splenic artery. When the blood enters the red pulp in the marginal zones, macrophages are present, and these macrophages are particularly good at recognizing, phagocytosing, and destroying encapsulated organisms. The most important being Salmonella, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, and Neisseria meningitidis. In the absence of a spleen, for example when it needs to be removed after trauma, or sometimes to improve the red blood cell count in patients with sickle cell anemia, individuals will need to receive a vaccine which specifically protects them against encapsulated organisms, because they will lose the ability to efficiently recognize and clear these types of organisms. The vaccine, unfortunately, only protects against these three organisms. There's actually no vaccine for Salmonella yet. To remember the important encapsulated organisms, you can use this mnemonic here, S-SHIN. The last few things to mention on this slide, for the sake of completeness, is that once blood has filtered through, it of course will be collected by the venous drainage. This of course leading to the splenic vein. Just a final question before we move on. What would you call this B-cell follicle here? Would you call it a primary follicle or a secondary follicle? Well, from the looks of it, it looks like it's pretty homogeneous. As the author has drawn it here, there's really no germinal center. We would call this a primary follicle. This is what it would look like at rest, in the absence of an infection. Again, just like in the lymph node, when an infection is present and B cells have been activated to divide, you should expect to see a germinal center here, which begins to form, which pushes out B cells which have not been activated by their antigen. And that, my friends, concludes our discussion of the secondary lymphoid organs.